this is the last uh, of our um, of our talks. This is the, the last of the conference, and part of me is very very sad, but another part of me is so excited to listen to you. <laughs> so excited that uh, it, it's completely in emotions. Um, so, in many ways, as I say, that doesn't need much way to interact with people who love children's literature and fantasy. But still, let me say, um, as I say, read what she down as a child in the 1970s, and it was his favorite book. And it inspired him to become a writer himself. And of course, you will all know his first book, by the Paul, which won the Nestle Smartest Prize for Children's Literature. And the sequel, The Outlaw by the Paul, which won the BBC the Peter Book of the Year. His third book, Phoenix, which chose to represent the UK on the EBBY International Honor Book List and shortlisted for the Guardian Children's Fiction Award. And his new book, Tiger, will be published in October. I've been very, very lucky to have been sent a fan's copy, and it's an absolute treat. You know, you're in for a treat, seriously. So, uh, yeah, and watch it down. He's still SSA's favorite book, and I'm really, really looking forward to listening to him speaking to us about it today. Please join me welcoming SSA. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me here today to be part of this extraordinary event. Um, it's an absolute honour, privilege and pleasure to talk about the book that is still my very favourite book. Uh, I consider it to be one of the very greatest books of all time. I'm no scholar, I've been listening to the last couple of sessions quite in awe of the stuff that's been going down. I'm just a reader and a writer, so these are going to be some quite personal thoughts, memories, and reflections about Watership Down and me. Watership Down is now 50. I am 55. So <laughs> it was originally published when I was just five years old, uh, back in 1972. I first encountered it in 1975, when I was eight. And that is where I want to start today, with this object, the puffin edition of Watership Down that was absolutely everywhere at that time. I'm sure some of you uh, Catherine mentioned this was the book. This is this is just it, isn't it? This is the object many of us encountered and further with. Um, my mum came to me one day with that book. She said, oh, I've just read this. It's the best book ever. You've got to read it. <laughs> now, I grew up in London. I was very much a, an urban kind of a child. I don't think I'd even seen a rabbit in real life. <laughs> um, and although I love reading, very enthusiastically, uh, this was almost 500 pages long. My mum must have seen the look of panic on my face because she immediately said, no, it's all right, don't worry. If you don't like it, no one is going to force you to read the whole thing. But please, give it a go. Try page one, see what you think. All right, I said, I open up the book, I begin to read. And from that very first page, really couldn't stop. The adventures of those rabbits were so much darker and more dangerous than anything I could have imagined. Everything in the world seemed to be bigger than them, stronger than them, and it was all coming to get them. Just to survive in that dark and dangerous world, they had to be so much braver and more brilliant than they ever knew they could be. They had absolutely nothing going for them, apart from their courage, their resourcefulness, and their friendship, their comradeship with each other. I really couldn't stop turning the pages just to find out how are they going to do it? How are they going to live? And as I turned those pages, as I read that book, I remember very, very clearly thinking, thinking to myself, all right, my mum is right. That really is the best book ever. <laughs> and one day, one day, maybe I could try to write something that is even half as good as this. I really do believe my life changed forever at that moment because ever since then, that is all I have been trying to do. I put Wardship down away on the shelf when I had finished reading it. I wasn't a kid who reread books. That's something I began to do only as an adult. But I kept it. I hung on to it through all the many changes of my life. Even as the memory of reading it faded, I always knew this was something special. This was a kind of treasure, really. It was an object that was part of in a very deep and personal kind of way. So even when I was obliged to give away my childhood books every time we moved, Watership Down was one that survived. Somehow it found a way. It's one of only a handful of books that made it out of my childhood and stayed with me throughout my life. There it is today. I reread that book for the first time when I was 35 years old. 
It was now the year 2002. I'd just finished writing my own first book, Barjack Paul, a story about a cat who dreams of becoming a great warrior and has to learn how to survive in a very dark and dangerous world. Well, Barjack hadn't been published yet. It was still in proofs. And I was working as a journalist to try and make ends meet. I was very lucky. I had some editors at the Daily Telegraph who let me write about my favourite things. Books, films, comics, anything that I loved and thought was interesting. They thought I was good at communicating my enthusiasm. So as Watership Down was just coming up to its 30th anniversary at the time, I pitched them the idea of an interview with Richard Adams to celebrate the 30th anniversary of this amazing book. Much to my delight, they said yes. Even more amazingly, so did he. To prepare for that interview, took Watership Down off the shelf and reread it, looking at it again for the very first time since I was eight. It's really, really difficult for me to put into words the experience that followed. It was a little bit like remembering a fever dream I'd had as a child. It was like refinding whole lost continents of my inner geography, maybe strata of my inner geology. I was seeing the secret structures and workings of my own mind laid bare. So much of the way that I think about the world and the way I think about stories, it's all right there in those pages. So many things I thought were original somehow, unique to me. No, no, no. There they all were. <laughs> well, I can tell from your reaction, this experience of reconnecting with our favourite childhood books, many of us have had it. It's so powerful, isn't it? Some people uh, talk about this in terms of nostalgia or comfort reading. Nothing like that for me. This was electrifying. This is like discovering an oracle that knows everything about you. The force of revelation had an almost religious intensity to it, taking me right back to one of the deepest sources or wellsprings of my own being. I think that's what great children's books can do for us. One of the many things. Of course, I have to admit, it's not always like that, rereading a childhood favourite. No, sometimes they're kind of disappointing, aren't they? Sometimes they're actually shocking. We'll shit down actually seemed even better when I was 35 than it had when I was eight. As a child, I'd seen that as a thrilling adventure story about rabbits trying to survive in the wild. As an adult, although I could see that the author took the rabbit stuff very seriously indeed, it was also a story about us, about the big questions of human life. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where do we belong? How should we live? How should we organise our societies and treat those who are different from us? It was still thrilling, but I could now see it was full of thrilling politics, philosophy, mythology, ecology. This was a soaringly ambitious work of literature that dealt with the most profound themes imaginable. And yet, it did this in the most accessible way, something I could easily grasp when I was eight years old and never forget, while offering all those endless layers, levels, to be discovered later on in life. I'd like to touch on a few of the things that particularly stood out to me on that first rereading of Watership Down 20 years ago. First of all, the mythology. I've heard a lot about it today. It's amazing, isn't it? The tales the rabbits tell each other about their legendary ancestor, El Ahmedabar, a great trickster hero. Those stories within the story, woven into the main narrative, threaded through the rabbit's adventures, counterpoint, bring them to life, inspire them, propel them. And then, at the very end of the book, there's that electrifying moment when myth and reality come together. And El Ahrera, and I'm in no doubt it's El Ahrera, the black rabbit, been there, it's not a star like it's it, sorry. Uh, El Ahrera comes to ask Hazel to join his house. Yeah, that's the moment of Hazel's death, isn't it? And that in itself, had had a massive impact on me as a child. To see a death represented that honestly, that clearly, that explicitly in a book, very, very unusual. But as an adult, I found that moment just stunning. Imagine going into the mythic realm, becoming a myth oneself. What a death. You couldn't wish for anything better. And what a piece of writing to bring together the two great strands of your narrative in that way. 
Well, this is a weaving of a modern story with an ancient mythology that clearly imprinted itself somewhere very deep in my unconscious mind because it seemed that was precisely what I had done in my book. It continues to be something I do in all of them, right up to the new one, Tiger. I can't help it. This is just how I feel a great story should be. There should be stuff happening now, counterpointed by a mythic background that we gradually learn more about as the book goes on. In Varjak Kaur, we first learn about mythology through the tales of Jalal that Varjak's grandfather tells him. Jalal is their legendary ancestor. He is the original Mesopotamian blue cat, who was the greatest hunter, a mightiest warrior, came out of Mesopotamia, traveled to the ends of the earth. Of course, I can trace an absolutely clear, straight, direct line between the myths of El Ra and the tales of Jalal. It's blindingly obvious, isn't it? <laughs> but it seems that I found the coming together of the mythic and the real at the end of Watership Down so exciting that I made Varjak's encounter with his legendary ancestor an even bigger part of my book. It's the very spine of Varjak Paul. There's a whole series of chapters in which Varjak meets Jalal in his dreams in Mesopotamia, the land of his ancestors. And Jalal teaches him a long lost secret martial art known only to cats that proves to be the key to his survival in the real world. The idea that dreams might give us access to a deeper, truer kind of reality, perhaps even to the mythic realm itself, well, that's also something I can trace directly back to Watership Down. But I'd like to just talk a little bit now about another aspect of the book that means an awful lot to me personally. I've mentioned Mesopotamia. That is the ancient name of the country we now call Iraq, which is where some of my own family originally came from. My roots are all over the Muslim world. My ancestors were Iraqi, Egyptian, Kurdish, Circassian, possibly Turkish. As I say, I grew up in London. I moved there when I was two years old with my mum. Back then, origins like mine were pretty unusual in Britain. Negotiations around identity, difference, and belonging, daily facts of my life. Even my name was an issue when I was growing up. It's a very ordinary Arabic name but it's completely unpronounceable if you don't speak Arabic. And I know this because it gave me so much trouble when I was growing up, I ended up using initials just to make it easier for people. Also, it turns out initials are things quite a lot of writers I like to use, so I thought that was good too. <laughs> <laughs> there definitely weren't many other kids of Muslim or Middle Eastern origin around me back then. And there certainly weren't a lot of children's books that dealt with my identity in any way at all. In fact, I can only really think of one, and that is Watership Down. Because although this was a story about rabbits, it seems to me there was quite a bit of Arabic, or something that looked a lot like Arabic in this book. Most notably, of course, El Ahrenar himself. It was stunning for me as a child to see that the great hero of the rabbits had something that looked an awful lot like an Arabic name. I cannot tell you how deep a chord this struck for me. It gave me what the writer Juno Diaz has described as a feeling of seeing myself reflected, realizing that my background might not be a burden, maybe wasn't some kind of shameful baggage, but was taken seriously, perhaps celebrated even, in the best book ever, a book that I love. This was incredible. This was perhaps the first moment I can remember when I began to see that Arab and Islamic history, culture, civilization, they were things I could be proud of. And that, I think, is an extraordinary gift for a book to give a child. When I eventually came to interview Richard Adams in 2002, I learned that he had spent time in the Middle East during the Second World War, that he had learned some Arabic there, and that, yes, some of it had indeed found its way into Watership Down. Talking about the rabbit language of Lapin, he told me some of it was based in Arabic, which I learned in Palestine. He gave me the following example. Kiha the seagull. Well, the Arabic for the sea is Al Baha. And I admire this because it sounded just like a wave breaking on a beach, I thought. Mm -hmm. Kiha is a copy of that. Big Wick says it at one point. He says, that's his name, Kiha. It's the sound of water makes. <laughs> well, I can tell you that all of this felt incredibly validating, welcoming, inclusive. 
in a way that was pretty much unique in 1975, when I first read Board Shut Down, and remarkably still pretty much unique, even in 2002. But to my mind, this is absolutely part and parcel of what I would call the most politics. At the heart of Watershed Down, I see a profoundly inclusive political philosophy. He himself is a great example. Rabbits don't normally befriend big, ferocious seagulls. Most rabbits are terrifying. <laughs> but Hazel sees the possibilities of transcending those barriers, reaching out, making friends with a bird like that. And the bird becomes crucial to the survival of the rabbits. He saves the day. They really would never make it without him. Hazel also makes friends with a mouse, although all, all the other rabbits cannot see the point of this at all. Some of them even make fun of it. But this mouse also turns out to be a vital power. The mouse gives the warning, everything's are coming, saves the day. I think this is perhaps Hazel's greatest quality as a leader. He can think outside the box, beyond received wisdom, beyond prejudice. Hazel is open. And the society that he shapes is open in a way that his original Warren is not, and the other Warrens that they encounter are not. That open vision, I think, runs all the way through Watership Down. So that what is on the face of it, a very English story about a very English landscape and its inhabitants, becomes something much more universal, open to everyone. We've heard quite a bit today about the Aeneid. People do often describe Watership Down as the Aeneid with rabbits. Well, personally, I think the Aeneid is Watership Down for Romans. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's only for Romans. The Aeneid is all about the glorification of Rome and its origins, whereas Watership Down seems to me a much bigger, wider kind of a story than that. That's not to say that the book doesn't reflect the sensibilities of an Englishman who was born just after the First World War, received a Victorian classical education, fought in the Second World War, and then returned home to work for the civil service in the Department of the Environment. Yes, you can see all of that in the book. And yet at the same time, I think perhaps because Richard Adams chose to tell his story in the form of an animal tale, it transcends any kind of human definition, classification, identification. This isn't about the glory of England. It's about the glory of life. <laughs> It really does feel to me like a much more all-embracing myth than anything Virgil ever wrote. <laughs> that, I think, must be one reason for the book's enormous impact, both geographically and historically. It's been read all over the world now, translated into well over 20 languages. When I interviewed Richard Adams back then, 20 years ago, he showed me what was a new foreign edition with an animal that was definitely not a rabbit. <laughs> he seemed totally comfortable with that. He was proud even, I think, that even countries which didn't have rabbits did have water shipped out mm -hmm. and could enjoy and understand and love his great story. And in terms of its continuing impact across time, well, I think we can see that very clearly in the fact that we are all here today celebrating the book 50 years on. Not many books are still read and loved and celebrated in this kind of way half a century after their publication. And although, yes, it is true, Watership Down is a product of its time, uh, as are all human creations. And yes, as with all human creations, there are things in the book that look like it. I was hearing some discussion of the word primitive, fairy bog dog. I don't want to go on, but yes, there are things that look like products of their time. But the essential core of the story doesn't seem to me to have dated one bit. That vision of an open, inclusive society is something that only feels more and more vital as time goes by. I think it feels more vital right now than it ever has before. When I reread all this shit down that very first time, 20 years ago, I felt a shock of recognition because I think personally this political dimension is equally central to what I want to do as a writer. Like the mythic dimension, it runs through all my books. The quality that allows Barjack Poor to succeed, the very same quality that Hazel has. He is open. He can think beyond prejudice. The other cats in the book believe no cat can talk to a dog. Dogs are huge, noisy, stinking monsters. Every cat knows this. And yet, Farjack not only talks to a dog, he makes friends with them and discovers that a dog 
could actually be the best, bravest, most loyal friend you could ever have. It was frankly a little embarrassing to me to see just how clearly the character of Kludge, the dog in Barjack 4, could be traced to Keyhart, mm. and also to that dog that ultimately defeats General Wounds in the final battle. Keyhart and the dog appear to have merged together in my unconscious, <laughs> emerging nearly 30 years later in the form of Kludge. <laughs> Even more startling for me to see the very word Kludge itself, which I thought I'd made up, Right there on page 108 of Horses Ship Down <laughs> in the story of the King's Lettuce. The lettuces, cried King Darcy, impossible. They are grown from good, healthy seed and guarded day and night. Alas, said Ella Herrera, I know it well, but they have been infected by the dreaded louse pedoodle that flies in ever decreasing circles through the gun pat of that clutch. <laughs> <laughs> gun pat of the clutch. <laughs> Shocked when I saw that. I couldn't remember it at all. <laughs> at least I didn't make Clubs the name. At least Clubs is not the name of a dog in Watership Down, <laughs> which would have been really <laughs> However, there is a rabbit in Watership Down by the name of Holly, just as there is a cat in Barjack Paul by the name of Holly. I thought that name was part of a playful Breakfast at Tiffany's reference. <laughs> and on one level, yes, it was. But on another, altogether deeper level, no, no, it's undeniable. There it is in Watership Down. The only thing that prevents all of this from being absolutely mortifying <laughs> was, was my certain knowledge that none of it was conscious. As I say, I had not looked at the book since I was eight. It had just shaped me at such a deep level, I wasn't aware of it. There are other examples I can give you, lots and lots of them, but I think it's sufficient to say that the debts I owe to Watership Down and to Richard Adams can never be fully recounted or repaid. Beyond all those specifics, though, there is the project itself, the kind of book that it is. Watership Down is a notoriously difficult book to define. What is it exactly? Children's work or a book for adults? When I interviewed him, Richard Adams told me, it's a book. <laughs> I wrote it for my little girls, and they were quite up to reading it. It wasn't aimed at any audience at all except my little girls. I had never thought of myself as writing for any particular public. It gets me a bit annoyed, actually. I remember one chap who said, what age group is it aimed at, Mr. Adams? And I said, sort of 80 to 88, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so while his daughters were the original readership, he thought really highly of them as readers. He didn't think there was anything that they couldn't handle. I love that. I think I sensed it, and I loved it as a child. But as an adult who now writes children's books, I feel the deepest admiration and appreciation for the way that he always trusts and respects child readers, never, ever talking down to them, never softening or simplifying anything, never giving them anything less than everything he's got. It's my belief that the books, which we call children's books, are really books that are written for an audience that includes children, but excludes no one. Children's books, I think, are really books for everyone. That's what I believe anyway, and that's what I'm trying to write. Even when my editors occasionally question, can children really handle the kind of things you want to put in this book? I know they can, because Watership Down shows that they can, very, very clear. Perhaps more than any other book, it's established the possibility of books for everyone. It was one of the first great crossover books, read by adults and children alike, long before Philip Pullman, J.K. Rowling, there was Richard Adams. What they went on to do, he did first. I think one could compare Watership Down to a family film such as Star Wars, which was loved by audiences of all ages, all over the world. So much so that it became part of our shared global culture. It's very interesting to me that Watership Down and Star Wars came out within five years of each other. They were two of the biggest cultural phenomena of the 1970s. They were two of the biggest inspirations for me as a child, as they were for many of my generation and for generations beyond. They have continued to resonate generation after generation. It was fascinating then for me to learn that Richard Adams and George Lucas, the director of Star Wars, had one very big thing in common. And I think Daniel has already mentioned that today, Joseph Campbell, the professor of comparative mythology, whose work had deeply influenced them both, who had been in life a friend and mentor to them both 
showing them how mythic narratives work, how certain archetypal stories, characters, and images occur in mythologies around the world. Richard Adams told me when I interviewed him well, that Watership Down had been closely modeled on the ideas of Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. He told me he had bought it when it was first published in 1949 and read it straight through twice. He then sought out Joseph Campbell, where he lived in New York, introduced himself, oh, they spent the day together and became lifelong friends. <laughs> Richard Adams said, I think the happiest thing that has ever happened to me is my friendship with Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Extraordinarily, there was a dinner party uh, for uh, Joseph Campbell's 80th birthday in New York. Richard Adams and George Lucas were the speakers. <laughs> Richard Adams said, my speech was much the best if I say it myself. <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to write that down, felt disrespectful. <laughs> Take it in the spirit in which it's intended. Under Campbell's influence, he went on to produce a grand mythic narrative of his own. So steeped in mythology, it became a modern myth itself. Tapping into the power of narratives that have survived for millennia, it shares their timeless, profoundly enriching sense of death. You can see some of its roots in the epigraphs at the top of each chapter, which we've heard all kinds of interesting things. I'd love to see that spreadsheet. Um, they were taken, I believe, at least he told me, they were taken from the reading that had shaped his own sensibilities. So there's the epic of Gilgamesh, the ancient Mesopotamian myth that is perhaps the oldest story that we know. There's Greek tragedy, Bible, Shakespeare, and there's even a quotation from Joseph Campbell's The Hero of a Thousand Faces. <laughs> apparently, there was quite a lot of pressure from his publishers to cut those epigraphs out. Uh, apparently, they said, no, they're too much for children. It seems his daughters were the ones who told them to keep them in. And I think we should all be very grateful to them for that, as well as for inspiring the story in the first place. I will admit, and I don't think I'm the only one. Yes, as a child, many of the epigraphs went right over my head too. <laughs> they also gave me the sense that this was something huge. This was something with real weight, scope, and mystery. And again, they made me feel that this was a book that trusted me as a reader. There was something so empowering about that. So even if I didn't understand all the epigraphs, I love them, and I love the book for including them. In some ways, all I've ever wanted to do as a writer is to pass some of that on, to try to give my readers some of the feelings, some of the gifts that Watership Down and my other favourite childhood reading gave to me. That feeling of being trusted, taken seriously by a book. That feeling of being transported into another world, which is our world, and yet seen through such a different perspective, it changes the way the world works after when we stop reading. I want to pass on that feeling of not being able to stop reading, having to keep turning the pages, but then coming away from the book with questions, ideas, images that could stay with you forever. I also want to write books for 8 to 88 or maybe even beyond. Books for everyone with levels and layers that might repay a lifetime dream. That project for me was established by Watership Down, and it still sets the bar for what can be done. For all of these reasons and more, it was a remarkable thing for me to go and meet Richard Adams when I interviewed him 20 years ago. He was 82 at the time. We had a fascinating conversation. I learned all sorts of things I never knew. At the end of the interview, I must have the courage to tell him how important his work had been to me and how I had now written a book of my own. I should very much like to read it. I thought he was just being polite, but I sent him a proof copy of our Jack Paul. I was then astonished to receive a letter telling me he had enjoyed it. He even used the word brilliant about my book. <laughs> that was one of the most unexpected and amazing things that has ever happened to me. <laughs> Time has moved on again. It's now 2022, the 50th anniversary of the publication of Watership Down. And it's almost 20 years since the publication of our Jack Paul. I'm now beginning to hear from adults who read Varjak as children and who kept it, often as one of a handful of books that survived from their childhoods, just as I kept Watership Down. Sometimes they're now passing Varjak Paul in turn. I've heard from teachers who read Varjak Paul when they were at primary school as children, and they're now reading it to their classes as teachers in primary schools. It's 
unbelievably moving for a writer to hear a thing like that. It makes me feel as if there is a great chain of stories that links us all through the ages, right back to the ancient myths. It's quite magical to feel my work might be a link in that great chain. My books might become part of somebody else's life, as my own favourite books were part of mine, and that maybe I might have succeeded in passing on some of what mattered most to me as a child. When children ask me now, what's your favourite book? I always say Watership Down. I tell them there would be no large act Paul without Watership Down, and I encourage them to read it themselves. I've also gone on rereading it myself. I reread it last year in the late stages of working on my new book, Tiger. I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but I can tell you that I've been wrestling with a very difficult scene towards the end of Tiger. I just couldn't quite get it right. The moment I reread Bigwig's last stand and the final battle with General Wingward, I knew exactly what I had to do. Watership Down never, ever stops inspiring me. I reread it again while writing this keynote. I finished it on the train here. <laughs> this is now the fifth time I've read that book, and each time it only ever gets richer and deeper and more powerful. I know I'm very far from alone in feeling this. I know a great many of us feel the same. While I was writing this keynote, I put out a call on Twitter for stories of the impact and influence of Watership Down and was overwhelmed with responses from all sorts of people. You can see them on the Twitter thread. I'll show you a few after this. Um, they are amazing, quite moving actually. Um, but I just want to read you a few responses that I received privately that you can't see on the Twitter thread. So the current children's laureate, Joseph Quilio, He's another writer who loves Watership Down. He told me he saw the film first as a child, and he still has the original poster. <laughs> he said, it struck a chord, opening up this unseen world of nature and its brutality and our place within it. The book revealed a softer, deeper element of an appreciation of the natural world, of the benefits of stopping and looking, an almost spiritual nature seen in the close detail given of the various plants the rabbits encounter, and of course, the visions of fire. I've also heard from the authors of some of the most popular contemporary children's books that deal with the natural world. M.G. Leonard, author of Beetle Boy, Kieran Marwood, author of Hodkin One Ear, and Piers Torday, author of The Last Wild, all told how huge an inspiration and influence Wall Shit Down had been for them. M.G. Leonard told me, it is a story that will forever haunt me. It was a call to arms that I still try and answer. <laughs> Bear Storday said, Watch It Down is a story that changed my life and permanently burrowed into the warrens of my life. <laughs> very much how I feel too. I just want to read you one of the responses from the Twitter thread, uh, which is not my experience, but I love it. It's from a reader called Claire Bolton. She says, My dad read it to me at bedtime. I still cry out in joy whenever I reach a hilltop. Frick on the hill, you can see the whole world from me. <laughs> I wish Richard Adams was still with us, so he could have enjoyed all of this. But I hope he knew that his legacy was secure. Legacy certainly seems to have been very important to him. I think he knew exactly what he was aiming for when he was writing War's Ship Down. There's a little bit towards the end, uh, just before that final battle. If we ever meet again, Hazel Rudd said down the line, as he took cover in the grass verge, we ought to have the makings of the best story ever. <laughs> You'll be the chap to tell it, said Hazel. Well, it's still my belief that Watership Down is the best story ever. Richard Adams was the chap to write it. <laughs> but perhaps the most affecting passage in the book, for me, is that one that shows Hazel and Bigwig and the others at the end being celebrated as heroes by younger generations in the Warren. I love that. It makes such a moving contrast to the fate of El Akira in the myths who saves his warrant at a terrible cost to himself, only to find on returning home that nobody knows or cares what he has done. He and Rav Scuttle are totally forgotten. Do not think Richard Adams or Wardship Down will ever be forgotten. In the article I eventually wrote after that interview in 2002, the last line was, 30 years ago, Richard Adams did something truly extraordinary. And if it has not faded yet, perhaps it never will. It's now been another 20 years. Watership Down is now 50. 
and still shows no signs of failing, certainly not from the memories of its readers, but also not from the culture at large. Although I joke about the Aeneid being watershed down for the Romans, <coughs> watershed down really is part of a shared global culture, a mythology for modern times, something completely new, and yet timeless, transcendent, truly universal. It's a part of who we are as human beings. And I think it always will be, not just at 50, but for as long as there are readers and writers, stories and books. Richard Adams, like his creation, has entered the mythic realm. Thank you very much.